Ah, good morning. Mike is a very difficult act to follow. He's got such vast experience in 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 all aspects of vaccine trials, and um, and also his enthusiasm is so great that he almost always exceeds the amount of time he's supposed to have for his talk. So um, it's a hard act to follow in in those two respects. So I'm going to talk about um, a very specific act. We might cover the whole field. I'm going to focus really on a very small field, but a very important field is how you actually decide how large to make a, a vaccine trial. And that is sort of critical in terms of whether you're going to get a result that is, determines whether your vaccine in the end is going to be licensed or not, or at least interpretable. So what I want to cover in, in the talk is really the relationship between, this will be very familiar to those of you that are statisticians, it may be less familiar to those of you that are not statisticians, so uh, I apologize for the statisticians, it will be at a fairly basic level, and for the others, I apologize, because you may think it's not at a basic level. Um, so I'm going to talk about the relationship between statistical significance, statistical power, and trial size, how to calculate the required sample size for a trial, to have defined power to detect a specific vaccine efficacy. How do you actually choose what efficacy you want to detect? Um, do you always want to do a one-to-one -one ratio of vaccine to placebo, or do you sometimes want to do something different? And the reasons why you might have for doing that. A bit about, important a bit about power in trials based upon the lower confidence bound on the efficacy a little bit about non-inferiority trials and non-statistical factors uh, when thinking about planning trial size. So you I think, familiar now with all the different phases of trials. Rarely sample size calculations are done for phase one trials. They're basically first in human um, and just test safety and immunogenicity in a small group of volunteers. In phase two trials, which are normally about safety, and immunogenicity, and sometimes efficacy, um, if you've got a, a more common condition. Larger number of volunteers, and they're, as, as Mike said, they're used for dose finding, how many doses do you need, how much space do you need between the different doses, and the sample size calculations that are done for that depend very much on the endpoints of primary interest, with usually some immunologic measure. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to focus mainly on phase three trials um, and some late phase two trials for the more common conditions, something like malaria, for example, um, do usually design primarily to measure efficacy rather than immunogenicity. Immunogenicity is an important measurement in the trials, but they're primarily designed to look at efficacy, where it's efficacy against some specific event of public health interest, some disease event of public health interest generally. They're often called pivotal trials um, in that these, this is the main part of the package that will be submitted to a regulatory agency in terms of the performance of the vaccine to decide whether it will be licensable or not. And so the sample size for the trial is calculated in order that there will be a, a high chance we call that power, the power of the trial, a high chance of showing a, a positive result. And we're going to talk about positive as being a statistically significant result, because that's what you need to persuade the licensee agency that you're really seeing a real effect. Um, that there is a, a really a protective effect of the vaccine of some specified size. And we'll talk a little bit about how you choose that size. So to determine the required size of a trial, you've got to specify first what efficacy you're going to detect, what statistical significance level you're going to use for that, and what you want the power of the trial to be. Do you want it to have an 80% chance, 90% chance? Uh, you might want it to have 100% chance if it really works, but you'll see that has some cost in terms of uh, how large you have to make the trial. Safety is obviously an important item in all trials, um, but that's not generally the primary um, endpoint in phase three trials. Obviously, safety is looked at, but it's normally not the prime driver of the study size. 
There are some exceptions to that. We're going to talk about one of those this afternoon, the, the rotavirus vaccine trials, where there were significant safety concerns about Shield and the subsequent vaccines that were tested had to do very large trials because it was a safety endpoint that was the primary endpoint. Normally, regulators will require um, to consider licensing a certain amount of data on safety. And the sort of general rule of three that I think still they apply is that you generally have to have followed at least 3,000 vaccinated individuals for two months after vaccination, because we know most adverse effects occurred in that period. And there is the so-called rule of three. If you expect to see three events, um, then there's a high chance of observing at least one. So if you follow 3,000 people, there's a high chance of actually seeing an adverse effect that affects one in a 1,000 people. That's the sort of basis for that, that 3,000 number. Obviously, other rarer adverse effects may be very important, but they're generally only be going to, going to be detected in probably post-licensure trials. So let's consider a hypothetical example. Suppose we actually do a, a two-arm placebo-controlled trial with a vaccine that actually has zero efficacy. I don't know that, but that, suppose that's the reality. And it has the same effect on the, the primary endpoint, whatever that is, as the, as the placebo. So if we do that trial, we generally expect the disease rates in the two arms, the vaccine and placebo, to be identical. But it's unlikely that they will be exactly identical because of statistical variation. Just as if you toss a coin 10 times, you'd expect five heads and five tails, but you wouldn't be too surprised if it didn't come down as uh, five heads and five tails. You might be a bit surprised if it was one head, uh, zero heads and 10 tails. Um, and we can use statistical theory to actually work out those probabilities. So in that coin, coin tossing experiment, we actually can calculate that the actually the probability of it coming down as five heads and five tails is about only 25%. And the rest of the time, you can see that um, it's unlikely to be only one head or nine heads, but we can actually calculate that distribution on the basis of statistical theory. So let's now go to look at a, a, a hypothetical vaccine trial of a vaccine which has zero efficacy. Suppose we've got N people in each arm, and the probability that they develop disease during the study is P in each arm. So in those circumstances, there's a 95% chance that when we actually calculate the difference in the proportions of individuals who develop um, disease in the two arms, we'd expect zero, which is the zero there, but, um, oops, pressing the wrong button. No, it doesn't matter. Um, but we've, it's, it's zero plus or minus two times that standard error. And that standard error is um, simply defined by, um, some of you may have dimly recall the binomial distribution, just based on the binomial distribution. So for example, if there's 100 in each arm, we expect 20% develop the, the disease in each arm, then there's a 95% chance that the observed difference in the proportions developing the disease will be zero plus or minus 0 0.11, just using that simple formula. So if we just look at that, suppose we do lots of trials in which the, the efficacy is zero, we get a different result in each one, but if there really is no, no difference between them, then we can actually see what the distribution of those differences would lie. So that um, it would be, most zero would be most likely, that will be a distribution, and about 95% would fall within about two standard errors of that zero, which is that simple binomial formula there. So suppose we want to narrow that confidence interval in, in the difference, have a smaller difference. How can we do that? Well, we can really, generally can't change P, that's the probability of developing disease, but we can change N, the number in each arm. And as we increase the number in each arm, then that number uh, with N in the denominator there will shrink. So we can actually shrink the distribution um, by increasing the size of the trial. Now, suppose we do a different trial, 
in which we, the difference between the two arms is not zero now, but is something D. And so there is a real effect of the vaccine, which um, in terms of a difference in the proportion of people developing disease in the vaccine arm and the placebo arm. We can use a similar sort of explanation that we'd expect the actual difference we observe to be D, but there will be a distribution around that because of statistical variation. It's a slightly more complicated formula now, all again based on the binomial distribution, but just taking into account there's different P, P's in each arm, and you've got, you've got that distribution there. And again, we can shrink that distribution just by increasing the size of the trial. So when it comes to actually um, designing the, the, how large you want the trial to be, you take both of those into account. What, what, what will the distribution be if there really is no difference? And what will the distribution be if there really is a difference D, some efficacy of a different given size? And you can see there that um, even if there's no, well, let's say that this, let's suppose this is, we say this is a statistically significant difference, let's say P less than 0.05, then you can see there will be a chance that when we do the trial, um, if there really is no difference, there's a chance that we'll say there is a difference because it will be statistically significant. That's the sort of one in 20 chance of saying there is a difference when there isn't one. On the other hand, if the true difference is D, then we can see there's a probability that we actually will say there isn't a significant difference, even though there is a true difference D. So that area there is the probability of saying, of getting a non-significant result if there really is a difference D. And one minus that, which is this area here, is the what we call the power of the trial. That's the probability of getting a significant result if the difference really is D. And we obviously want to make that as large as we can. And the way in which we can actually increase the power is just by shrinking those curves. But if we increase the, 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 the size of the curve, uh, size of the sample in each, then we can shrink these and we can increase the power of the study. So that's basically how we go about selecting the sample size. But we have to decide in doing that, what is going to be D? What is going to be the vaccine efficacy that we design the trial to detect? Um, so we've usually got some idea of the efficacy based upon the immunogenicity data. If you only have an immunologic response in 50% of the people, you might argue it's unlikely you're going to get an efficacy greater than 50% if you are measuring the right immune response. And that's always a, an important question. Um, is, is the, you want to actually have a vaccine efficacy which is high enough that when you take it to a regulator um, they, and you show that there is that efficacy, they will actually say, well, that's good enough to license the product. So that will normally require a prior discussion with a regulator about the design and what the trial is designed to detect. But as well as getting it past the regulator, you have to think about how big must the efficacy be in order that vaccination programs are going to say, yeah, this is a effect which is big enough in order to introduce this into a vaccination program. So it's very different from licensure. Licensure is an important first step. But the next step is, is the effect of this vaccine going to be sufficient to actually make it cost effective to introduce this into a vaccine program? Um, so you have to decide what's a reasonable target efficacy. And that depends also on what you decide the primary endpoint is going to be. Most of the vaccines that, or many of the vaccines that we actually um, use are really designed to, and certainly in low and middle income countries, are designed to stop people dying of the condition that we're vaccinating against. But if we use death as the primary endpoint, what you find is that you need an enormous sample size. So we have to choose a, an endpoint which we think is going to be important and probably correlates with the probability of dying. We won't know that for certain often. So if we're looking at malaria, we could either take clinical malaria, we could take severe malaria, um, or we could take death from malaria. And so in, we have to make a decision as to which of those endpoints 
often which of those endpoints it's really feasible to design a trial to detect. And often, if the endpoint is rare, the size of the trial might be sufficiently large to make it really not viable to conduct a trial. <coughs> so just a few examples. I mean, we're used to these days of vaccines, at least in the short term, having efficacy of sort of 80 or 90 percent um, or even higher. Um, but that vaccines may be very, very useful, even if they have lower efficacy. This is the, the RTSS malaria vaccine. And those trials, the initial trials, the initial trial that was done, follow up after after one year after dose three showed uh, oops, showed a, about a 50 percent efficacy. This is the um, Sanofi dengue vaccine um, and their trial um, after after about two years of follow up from first vaccination. It was a three dose vaccine given that one six months in one year had an efficacy of about 60 percent. Um, Rotavirus vaccines typically have very high uh, efficacy against rotavirus gastroenteritis, sort of 80, 90, 80, 90%. 80, 90%. Um, but if you're in public health terms, what you're really interested in is not whether it's going to reduce the burden of rotavirus. You're interested in that, but what you're really interested in is what effect is it going to have from gastroenteritis of any cause, whether that's severe disease or requiring hospitalization. And that, of course, depends upon the proportion of gastroenteritis that is um, uh, attributable to rotavirus. You can see lower efficacies there against that general endpoint than the specific disease, specific end, uh, agent specific endpoint. And then in the, uh, a, pneumoco a large pneumococcal trial that was done in the Gambia, uh, their primary endpoint was radiographic pneumonia, X-ray proven pneumonia, which they showed efficacy of nearly 40 percent. But there were other endpoints that they also looked at that, just clinical pneumonia, much more common condition. Um, um, but even that, they showed a significant efficacy against just clinical pneumonia. You can see 7 percent, but a, a confidence bound, which is greater than zero. They also looked at something which is of interest to people who run hospitals. Is this going to actually reduce the pressure on my hospital? And they, they, they showed hospital admissions were reduced from any cause, were reduced by 15%. And then unexpectedly, they also showed a 16% reduction in mortality, which was not, to, which was not, the study was not designed to show that. It didn't have the power to show that, but they did show it. And although, the radiographic pneumonia was the primary endpoint. The one the result that most people talk about is the one that wasn't the primary endpoint, which was the, um, but this wasn't a licensing trial. And then in the early days of, um, of COVID vaccines, um, WHO put out the preferred characteristics that they'd like COVID vaccines to have. This was before there were any vaccines. They said, ideally, we'd like somebody to have at least 70% efficacy, but we'd be very happy with something that had 50% point estimate of efficacy. Um, as it turned out, of course, the true efficacies were, in the, at least in the short term, much higher than that. So that, that um, and that influenced the design of the early trials. I look at there's a few sort of, to some of you simple, to some of you rather frightening um, formula here. Basically, in order to sort of, integrate what I said earlier about designing the size of the trial, you need to really estimate three things. First of all, you estimate how much disease you're going to have in your control arm. Um, and that's often the most difficult question to actually answer in the design of a trial. In the Gambia, where this trial was done, um, they've worked for really 10 plus years on trying to work out how much X-ray pneumonia there was in the infant population in the child population there in order to actually estimate what the disease rate there. So that's often very difficult to estimate. They then have to estimate what they're going to expect in the in the vaccinated arm, and that depends upon what vaccine efficacy it's designed to detect. And there they actually specify 20%. They thought a 20% reduction in X-ray pneumonia would be of public health importance and would justify introduction of the vaccine. Um, so you You've got that one. 
And then the rest of this formula here, you've got the R0, the R1. The rest of this formula is determined upon what you think the statistical significance you'll want and what you think the statistical power you want. So whether you want 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or power 80, 90. And these are just based upon the, the normal distribution. So you can plug, plug that, those into that formula. You can also rewrite that formula. Another way of expressing it is to say, just by multiplying both sides by R0, where Y is the person years of observation that you require in each arm to see the effect. You multiply that by R0, that's the number of cases of disease you'd expect, you'd expect to see in the control arm. And then the formula just reduces to this, which is, is, relates to the vaccine efficacy, doesn't involve R0 and R1. So the, the study size is essentially determined by the number of cases required, uh, which is the total disease events required, which is the number in the control arm plus the number in the vaccine arm. Um, and ideally, that's so, so just in, in terms of the pneumococcal trial in the Gambia, it was designed to have 80% power to detect vaccine efficacy of 20% at the 5% level of significance. And if you just plug that into, into that formula, um, you get, you require 353 cases about of radiological pneumonia in the vaccine arm, and then 80% uh, of that in the, sorry, in the control arm, and 80% of that in the vaccine arm. So you want to go have about 600 cases in all. Now, they calculated that on the basis of R0, how large a study will we require in order to get 353 cases in the control arm and follow up. If they got that wrong, as almost invariably investigators do get that wrong, then if you overestimate it, if you overestimate R0, you're not going to have enough cases at the end of the trial. If you underestimate it, then that's fine because you're going to have enough case, more cases than you expect. Um, and what you'd ideally like to do is to say, well, we'll just carry on the trial until we've got 636 cases. Um, that's fine with everybody except the funder, uh, because you, you then go to the funder and say, well, how much money do you want? Well, we don't know. Just keep giving us money until we've got 350. So that that is problematic. So what often happens is that you make an assumption about R0, you design the trial, you get to the end of the trial in terms of the time and money you had, but you say, well, you haven't, we haven't got there. So you go back to the funder and say, um, give us some more money to get there. And then they, the funder often wants to the, the DSMB to have a look at the results to see if there's any evidence that um, you're actually beginning to show that effect and it would be worth spending that money. But that's often complicated, but it's quite common. Um, so just the important point really is the size of the trial is the number of endpoints. It's not the number of people in it. You've got 10,000 people in the trial and only four endpoints. Then the trials of the cell in statistical terms is four, not 10,000. Um, and this just illustrates what the effect that obviously you'd like to, the power to be high and you'd like to use a smaller significance level. But the cost for that is that you lead, that's the, the Gambia study, the Neumococcal study as designed. Um, but you can see you need to double the size of the trial if you actually want to increase the power to 95% and have a lower significance level. And that, you know, that's twice as much money or twice as much time. Um, if you detect, want to detect, you say, well, let's power it to detect a 40% efficacy. That reduces the sample size substantially. But the danger of that is that it's high power, you have higher power to detect a 40% efficacy, but if the true efficacy is only 20%, then there's a good chance you won't detect that. And if you actually think a 20% efficacy is going to be of public health importance, then that's why they designed the trial, even though, as it turned out, in the trial, the efficacy did turn out to be 40%. Um, so that you can, by assuming high efficacy, you can reduce the size of the trial, um, but the cost of that is that you might miss a, 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 an efficacy which is of public health importance 
but it's not as high as you design the trial to detect. Um, now, you don't need to use any of those formula. You just go on the internet and there's, I think, the various sites here. You, you, you put in the power, the uh, p value that you're going to use, then you, the proportion disease developing the two groups, press calculate, and then it does it. Gives you the number of person years of observation, and then you can calculate that, and it comes out to about the same number as I gave you with the other formula. So uh, it's it's easy to do. Um, just a, a little, sometimes you don't use a one to one ratio. It's quite common to use a two to one or a three to one ratio. The reasons for doing that are several fold. Um, one, if the investigators think they've got a, a vaccine that they think is going to work, they feel a bit uncomfortable about half of people getting placebo. Often investigators are a bit over-enthusiastic about their vaccine, and that turns out not to be the case, but they'd like to have a different ratio. Also, it's believed that people are more likely to participate in the trial if they've got to twice the chance of getting the vaccine as placebo or three times the chance of getting a placebo. I don't know of any sort of evidence on that, but it, it seems not unreasonable. But the most important reason, I think, is that off the, 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 the phase three trial is the last chance often you've got of getting safety data in a, in a controlled, placebo controlled, uh, way. And so often the, the, the vaccine manufacturers will want to increase the number of people who actually get the vaccine in a phase three trial in order when they go to the regulator, they can say, we've now given this vaccine in X thousand individuals and we, haven't seen any adverse effects of concern. You, I, you don't lose much statistical power. I'm not going to dwell on this. You, if you want to do two to one, you need a, a study size, which is about 12.5% larger, to have the, the same power as if it was one to one. When it's three to one, it needs to be about 33% um, larger. So there is some cost, but not a great cost. I've talked about powering the study to reject the null hypothesis, to reject the hypothesis that the vaccine efficacy is zero, so that the lower confidence bound on the vaccine efficacy when you do the trial would be above zero. In general, that's thought not to be good enough. That if you if it's you know if, if that's where the confidence bound is, then you you're a bit uncomfortable about having a vaccine that you know okay it's thirty fifty percent efficacy, but the confidence bound goes down to close to close to zero. So it's more common to actually now base that calculation not on the lower confidence bound being greater than zero, but being greater than some defined amount. So this was a, a rotavirus trial that was done in India where they wanted the lower confidence bound to be greater than 20% when they thought the efficacy was going to be about 60%. It's a trial of um, the, the uh, Sanofi vaccine where they thought the efficacy was going to be about 70%, and they wanted the lower confidence bound to be greater than 25%, and it was powered to do that. Um, <clears throat> and then in the, in, the, in the COVID vaccines, the instructions that were put out by FDA were that they'd expect the, they would, the point estimate, this is the initial vaccine trials, the point estimate should be greater than 50, and the lower confidence bound should be greater than 30. So that, we, and they use those numbers to design the trial. The, the, um, you may think those low numbers are quite low, 20%, 25%, 30%. But again, it's the question of the price you pay. If you push that number up, then you push up the size of the trial substantially. I see Hannah hovering here. Um, so I haven't given you any formula for that. In any case, you should always talk to a statistician if you're going to design these trials, uh, and you certainly want to talk to a statistician if you're going to design it in that way. But this gives you some rough formula to see if the statistician is giving you the right answer. Um, a bit about non-inferiority studies. Often once we've got an existing vaccine, we're not so interested in whether a new vaccine is different from zero, but is different from the existing vaccine. And that's a very different question. Because suppose we've got a vaccine which has got 85% efficacy and we want to evaluate a new vaccine 
that we think is at least as efficacious as the existing vaccine, difficult to prove equality or impossible, but we're prepared to consider it as not inferior to the existing vaccine if we can be reasonably sure that it's no more than 5% less efficacious. So now we're looking at a difference between 85% and 80. So you can imagine what that does to your, your sample size. Um, so that if you would, if you were doing a, uh, couldn't do it now, but once the, the Pfizer vaccine had been, uh, trial had been done and you wanted to do a new trial with a head to head comparison with Pfizer, which had initially a sort of efficacy of around sort of 80, 90%, then you want to design a trial for a head-to-head -head comparison if you, if, you, uh, if you wanted to establish non-inferiority to that vaccine. Um, if you do that, the sample sizes become horrendously high, impossibly high. So, in fact, it's not done. And when you do that trial, when you, you've, if, if, if you do the trial, you either get a result, which is you show the new vaccine is inferior to the uh, existing one, you get an inconclusive result when it's slightly inferior, but the the confidence bound goes beyond the non-inferiority margin that you've defined. Um, that one you would say was non-inferior because you're actually above the non-inferiority margin, and that one you would say was su superior. So you can design trials to do that, but but with clinical endpoints, it's generally not feasible to do. So. Um, Generally, what's done is to do a comparison of immunogenicity rather than efficacy. Uh, and of course, there's big assumptions in that, that the immune response that you're measuring is actually a good indication of what the efficacy is going to be. Um, and then that then it comes much easier. For example, if you've got a an existing vaccine which CIDA converts 85%, you have an you want the new vaccine to uh you be sure it CIDA converts at least um, uh, eighty percent, say, a non-inferiority margin of five percent. Then a study of that size, an immunogenicity study of that size, would just require about six hundred people in each arm. Um, and if you if you think you can get live with a non-inferiority margin of ten percent, um, then that reduces to one hundred fifty-six. And again, there's calculators on the web to do that. Um, it's challenging because there's the assumption you've got to actually know there's a relationship between whatever immune response you're measuring and efficacy. Um, but that has sort of been accepted now for COVID vaccines. And uh, uh, a year or so ago, the first COVID vaccine was licensed in, in the UK. The uh, Valneva COVID-19 vaccine was licensed on the basis of given regulatory approval on the basis of non-inferiority, in fact, of superiority to the AstraZeneca. Um, you may ask, well, why they chose the AstraZeneca vaccine for that comparison when it was less endogenic than the Pfizer vaccine. So uh, it was easy to show ex uh, an excess there. Uh, but that was accepted by the regulator. And, it, and, sub and subsequently, a number of other vaccines have been approved on that basis. Um, there are other factors in co considering, I won't list these uh, because I'm mainly talking about the statistics, but there's just a list of other things. The most important one is this one, the instance of endpoints may be less than expected. And that's very common. Um, in COVID, it turned out to be the other way around. There are much more endpoints more than expected. So they've got their results very quickly. A um, few references, and then just as um, Anna mentioned at the end, a, a plug for a book, which I, co-edited. Um, and it's not all about uh, sample size. It's about all of the aspects of actually doing a field trial of a vaccine and all the things that generally don't get put into papers because the journals don't have space to put all the stuff in. So we've got a lot of people who've had a lot of experience of doing trials, not all of vaccines, but of other intervention studies. Um, and, <laughs> and perhaps the best thing about this book is it's free so that... Um, uh, at least uh, the PDF of it is free. So if you want to download it, you can download it from um, the website I've given there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Peter. I'm sure there are millions of questions. We are limited with time, so uh, let's take them uh, crisp and, and, and clear over there. And then.
Yeah. Uh, good morning, Mattis from WHO. Um, Peter, could you please uh, give us some considerations as to how one would power a trial for secondary outcomes? Is that ever done? You know, how, what is the approach to that? And in that context, you know, how one should read results of vaccine efficacy on secondary outcomes if the power um, calculations are not being done? The reason that I ask, because we recently had a lot of discussions about whether to recommend to include um, secondary outcome of vaccine impact on antibiotic use in trials. And it wasn't very conclusive whether we should do that or not, um, because, you know, if, if, if we have a couple of trials that would actually show that there is no effect, that could be misinterpreted and, you know, come to a conclusion, false conclusion, that vaccine do not actually impact antibiotic use. So I just wonder what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's an important question, and it does de- depend to some extent on what the purpose of the trial is is going to be. If it's to get a license for the trial, generally what the license aid agents are going to be is what you've defined as your primary endpoint and have you actually shown the efficacy that you decided on the primary endpoint um, and if you haven't shown it on that but you've shown it on some secondary endpoint then you're going to struggle to get your vaccine license because they would require the, the licensure in terms of doing the sample size calculations um, I think it's worth doing the sample size calculations for secondary endpoints that you think are important um, to see what they come out as. Um, obviously, if the sample size is smaller than for the primary endpoint, then there's no problem. Uh, but if you think it's an important secondary endpoint and it turns out with a larger sample size than for the primary endpoint, then that may not um, uh, well, won't matter with respect to the primary endpoint because you're going to have more people in the trial than you, you needed. Um, and it then needs a question of actually whether the the funding for the trial, the funder for the trial is sufficiently convinced that you're to fund that bigger trial in order to get at that secondary endpoint. And I think there's a difference here between licensing trials and trials that you might do for public health purposes. For example, the trial in the Gambia uh, on pneumococcal vaccine, that wasn't a licensing trial. Um, and they had, an, although they had a primary endpoint, they had another number of other endpoints which were important in terms of deciding whether you're going to use the vaccine in, 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 in public health use. And we're in a similar situation with the maternal RSV vaccine, which is that Pfizer have produced, which is probably going to be licensed within, within, the, within the coming months. And they, they, they've got a, a primary endpoint of RSV in the, in the infant, but there may be other effects uh, on that, which is going to be important to assess. And there, in, in a sort of post-licensure trial, which yeah. sometimes you can do in a, in, a, in a controlled way, it's important to look at all of the important endpoints that may be relevant with respect to, is this going to persuade uh, 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 a Ministry of Health to actually use this vaccine? Uh, and that, as we saw for, with the rotavirus example, it's not only the effect on rotavirus diarrhea, but it's the effect on all gastroenteritis as, as a whole that made that a very compelling case for actually using that vaccine. Yes, over there and then here. So my question is in continuation to his as well. So uh, we calculate the sample size on the primary endpoint. But however, when you're doing trials, there are subsets. Like, for example, the dengue vaccine trial. We have a viremia subset. We have uh, an exploratory endpoint, a net neutralization assay. So those subsets, how do you calculate? Is there a thumbs rule of what proportion to take for each of the subsets? For example, the viremia subset is a part of the immunogenicity subset. So the proportion that we take for these subsets. You mean what proportion yes. in terms of the of looking at immunogenicity, immunogenicity compared to looking at efficacy? Yeah, yeah I mean, often um, uh, a subset of – I mean, what's actually most important is that if possible, uh, you actually get some immunogenicity measure on everybody who is in the trial. Um, now, most people say, and you shook your head there, we can't afford to do that because that involves going and drawing blood and people don't like that. But if you actually get a sample post-vaccination, you've got a measure of the immune response of individuals post-vaccination. And then you follow those individuals to actually look at who develops disease. And then you can relate, is the probability of developing disease related to that immune response? And once you've established that, then the next vaccine down the line 
maybe we can use that immune measure as the basis for testing and licensing their vaccine when you've got, as it were, a validated immune response which correlates with efficacy. Uh, now, if you're the first vaccine along the line and you think it's going to be successful, the implicate, you may not want to do that because it means that the second person in the line is going to have a much easier path than you've had. But in public health terms, it would be much better to do that. In terms of what proportion that should be in general, uh, I don't think that's... I, I, that varies a lot, and I don't think there's a general rule of thumb. It shouldn't be too small. It's generally decided as to sort of what's feasible and what you expect to see in terms of the immune response over time. Because most vaccine trials actually have very poor power to look at how the, the protecting effect changes with time, because all of these calculations are determined on the initial vaccine efficacy. But, you know, if it starts off at uh, 90% and six months later it's down to 50%, you know, that's in, as, as many of the COVID vaccines now are in terms, in terms of infection. Um, that's important to know about, but most vaccine trials are not designed to actually look at that, uh, and not large enough. COVID is an exception because they're a bit bigger. But even that is, is, is difficult. Often they have to stop them too soon for ethical reasons. So that, um, I think you know, there's a long answer to, uh, a long non-answer to your question. But actually, we, we've been thinking of magic number of 60 for the immunogenicity, uh, uh, nested into the phase threes. I don't know, uh, whether that's, uh, that's like, uh, uh, varies from pathogen to pathogen, but that's how we establish the serological correlates for pneumo and, and for hip. In, in early days. 60 but, sounds a metric yeah, number. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, thanks. Um, two, two brief safety questions. One is sort of where the rule of threes come from, and perhaps the more important question is, if there's a vaccine efficacy, uh, if there's a phase three trial powered on efficacy, 15,000 participants and two cases of GBS in the vaccine group and none in the placebo group, how do we interpret that? With difficulty. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the rule of three, you'd have to ask a regulator that. I mean, it, it, and I'm not going to speak for the regulators on this occasion. Um, I mean, that the rule of three is basically you'd expect one adverse event. You'd expect one GBS or whatever. Um, if you actually see that, um, and it's in, you know, if it's one in the vaccine group and zero in the placebo group, then I think you might want to go back to say, well, how common is this condition in general? Um, if we see one in the vaccine group in these 15,000 people, what's the frequency of this condition in the general population of this sort of age group? And it, if it's extremely unlikely, then I think it's unlikely in one case a regulator is going to say, no, this vaccine is a non-starter. But if, 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 if you've got two or three cases, and that's way above what you might expect and there's none in the placebo group and in a in a population of that size in the general population do you expect zero at least they they i think uh raise a safety flag on that which would require further studies but but um again a non answer to the question i pass that on to grab a regulator at coffee let's take last two questions uh up there and then then here yeah thank you so much uh Emmanuel. uh I mean, phase three trials. I mean, as you said, they are large and take a lot of a little take a lot of time. Now, in that time, the endpoints of interest sometimes do change. The epidemiology, especially on some of the endpoints, does change. So, uh, and yet you had calculated the sample based on what the epidemiology was at that time. So, do you then revise the numbers midway, especially if the endpoint actually? the occurrences do reduce. So do you increase or change the sample size? Thanks. I think the short answer to that is yes, but it's obviously highly desirable to actually change the the endpoints for a study, the primary endpoint for study in the middle of a trial. It happens, and it happens in big trials. It happened in the, the pneumococcal trial in the Gambia, where the original study was designed to see if this, this the primary endpoint was to see if this vaccine would reduce all cause mortality. Um, but it turned out for various reasons 
in the middle of the trial, some of which were logistics, that that was no longer going to be feasible as a primary endpoint. And so the endpoint was changed in the middle of the trial to this X-ray pneumonia, um, which resulted in a smaller trial and enabled the trial to be conducted, whereas with the sticking with the original endpoint, it wouldn't have been possible to do it. Um, if you're going to do that and it's a licensing trial, then you've, you've got to have a lot of discussion with the regulators before you do that, because generally uh, they don't like that uh, for, for obvious reasons. Hi, Mila. Um, so you mentioned that, like, uh, determining the disease in the unvaccinated arm can be difficult, like uh, in sample size calculations. Um, so like in developing countries, mostly like um, we might actually have very limited data or poor quality data on what the burden of the, of that particular disease exactly is. So in those cases, like how do you go about calculating the sample size? Uh, do you actually need to first do like a burden of disease study or how or are the other ways around it? No, I think you have to. Well, you either have to do it uh, to, to, in two ways. You can say we decide, decide the, the study on observing a given number of endpoints and we continue the study until we've got that number of endpoints. So you don't have to know what the instance there is, but you also don't know how much money you're going to have to spend to do that and how long it's going to take. The other way is really to do those preliminary studies so that if you come to it, go to a fund and say, I want to do this study. I don't know what the instance is, is in the control arm, but you know, in this study, thousand kilometers away, it was this and so on and so forth. You might be able to persuade them, but generally it's better to have some local data <laughs> and that's why it's it's much easier for many reasons to do actually do uh, vaccine trials in sites that are and, and locations which are, are well established. That's the one that Mike mentioned in Barmaco, where they've been doing it for many years. Not only do they have much more data on what's happening in the local population with disease instance, but they're also trusted by the local community. Whereas if you a lot of vaccine trials have failed. Because people have gone, we've got a, we've got this new vaccine. Let's go and find a population we can quickly do a trial in. We've not worked with this population before. There's a lot of mistrust with respect to these strangers coming in to try and do this trial, and also without knowledge of the disease instance. So it's much better. Although it took ten years in the Gambia to get those data on on pneumococcal, um, it's much better to have that, that those baseline data than to go in. It, it's a, uh, it, it's a. Uh, well, to some extent, it, it, it yeah. pays off. It pays off in the in the COVID vaccine trials. I mean, they're a much higher instance than was expected there. But generally, you do need that that preliminary data if you can collect it.